Welcome, Jonathan. Hello. Hello, and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. Yes. And we'll head over to your presentation, Data Oriented Programming. Right. Uh, how much time do I have? You have uh, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. OK. Should be enough. And can you see my screen? Yes. All right. I'm setting myself a timer. 45 minutes. Great. So I'm here to talk about data-oriented programming. And I happen to have written a book on the topic, a physical book that is available also as an ebook, but also as a regular book with, you know, regular paper. And I'm here to tell you what is data-oriented programming, where and when it is relevant, and why it is a good choice, and especially how data-oriented programming allows us to reduce the complexity of information systems. My name is Yehonatan, and you can follow me and reach out on Twitter under the, hash, the handle V-I-E-B-E-L. All right, I've been a developer for a long time, maybe too much time, around 20, more than 20 years. I wrote a book called Data and Programming. I'm a blogger. I work as a closure wizard at Psychognito, and I'm the maintainer of a cool open source JavaScript plugin called Clips that allows us to evaluate code right in the browser. OK, so I said that data oriented programming allows us to reduce complexity. So I guess it's time to tell you what I mean by complexity. And in fact, in programming, we have two kinds of complexity. We have the computational complexity, which is about the amount of machine resources required to run a program, how much memory it takes, how much CPU it takes, etc. But we are not going to talk about computational complexity. Instead, we are going to talk about system complexity. And system complexity has to do with the amount of brain resources it takes to understand a system. And our goal is to reduce system complexity. And I found a really nice quote from 1986 from a book called SICP, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. That goes like this. Programs must be written first for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And in fact, nowadays, it is so easy to make a program work or even to scale a system, you know, by just scale the number of instances on the cloud. But uh, the number of instances in the cloud does not allow you to develop more quickly. And if your system is complex, even if you hire more developer, it's not sure that you will be able to deliver more quickly. So that's why I think it's super crucial to write code in such a way that complexity is not increased too much. And I'm not uh, going to claim that data oriented programming is a good fit for every kind of systems. I think it's a good fit for information systems. By that, I mean systems that manipul manipulate information. For example, web services, you know, they access the database, they fetch data from the database with a shape and they transform a bit the data maybe and then they serve it as JSON. That's an example of a web service. Web workers that listen to events and reach them and transmit, transform data through a pipeline. Or even maybe front-end applications that have to manage application state and they receive data from the backend and they generate data back to the backend according to user interaction. So those are examples of information systems. Uh, let me give you examples of things that systems that are not information systems, for example, a compiler, or 
I don't know, game engine, stuff like that. And uh, an important characteristic of information systems is that the program the, is not the owner of the data it manipulates. Usually the data lifetime goes beyond the program. You take the program takes data from another service, from a database, from a backend. And when data is not yours, you have surprises sometimes. And data authentic programming allows us to write our code in such a way that we can manipulate data in a flexible way. So what is data authentic programming? In fact, if I would need to summarize it in a short sentence, I would say it's a programming paradigm that treats data as a value or as a first class citizen. And what does it take? It takes, in fact, to follow four basic principles. And none of those principles are new. Uh, they are well known to developers for decades. But I think data oriented programming, the, the novelty of it is that the fact that it combines them together as a cohesive whole. And we will drill down, drill down later in the presentation in each of these those principles. Let me just mention them briefly for the moment. Number one, we separate code from data. So unlike in traditional object-oriented programming where data is encapsulated in classes, data is a first-class citizen. It has the right to live on its own, even without code. Number two, we represent data with generic data structure. Data has the right to be created with no ceremony, with no class, with no types with no structs, we are allowed to create data on the fly. Number three, data is a value. So values never change like numbers. So we don't, we, we don't mutate data. Instead, when we want to change data, we create a new version of data without affecting the current version of data. And finally, number four, we separate data schema from data representation. There are ways to validate that the, our data conforms to a schema. We have ways to validate data and it's very important, but we have the right to decide when and where we want to validate data. So we have the right to create data that is not validated. Okay. Before I explain how and why those principles reduce the complexity of the system, let's think about what usually makes a system complex. And for that, I'll take as an example, a li online library management system. You know, a system where you need to manage books, landings, uh, books are in a catalog, they're, uh, Books have authors, there are, they, they are users, there are administrators, et cetera, et cetera. The standard permission system. If you are a not super advanced object-oriented programmer, you'll probably come up with a class diagram similar to the one on the screen. So multiple entities, librarian, user, catalog, book, author, book item, et cetera. And the, from my experience, usually traditional object-oriented programming systems tend to be very, very intertwined. All the objects are related together. There are many, many rows, many edges, many connections, and it makes the system complex because we tend to have nodes with many edges. And also we have many kinds of arrows. You know, we have association, we have composition, we have inheritance, we have usage. And it makes the system how to understand and how to maintain. So first thing that we are going to do is to separate code from data. Code will be written either in stateless functions or in classes with static methods only, no state. And data at this point, it could be represented as a data class, meaning class with only members, no method, no methods or records, or as the previous speaker mentioned, case class in Scala, or even string maps. 
So let me show you how we will represent data in a language like JavaScript. So we would have a class called book and we have a constructor that receives a title and a publication year. And we have two members, title and publication year. Another option, as it is available in Java since Java 14, I think, a record or a case class in Scala. And third option, a string map. For example, in JavaScript, we have this curly brace literal to create string maps on the fly. And what about code? So code, we could either have it in a class, but if we want to have in a class, we need to constrain ourselves to static methods. So for example, let's say we need the functionality to retrieve book information from a book. So a nice little string that describes the book. So we would have a book info method that receives as an explicit argument, the book that the method needs to manipulate. There is no this, no self, no state. And if we prefer to write functions, again, function without state, no lexical scope, just function that receives the book as an argument. And why does it reduce system complexity? For the simple reason, reason that if you take a complex graph and you split each node into two, where on the left side you have the node that takes the code part and on the right side the node that takes the data part, then instead of an entangled system, you have two simpler systems. And our brain is made so that it's easier for us to understand two simple systems than one complex system. Okay, so that was principle number one. We separate between code and data. Principle number two deals with how do we represent data? And because data is a first class citizen, data is a value in data oriented programming, we want to represent data with generic data structure. What do I mean by that? Basically, it's string map. And in JavaScript, we have two ways to create string maps. We have the map constructor, where we need to pass um, the fields as tuples with the key of the field and the value of the field. Or we could use the literal for map. In JavaScript, it's called object, but in fact, it, it, it's, a, it's a map. So depending on the language, if it's Java, if it's Scala, Clojure, Ruby, whatever, you could choose one of the two. But no matter which one you choose, both of them are generic. Generic in the sense that you don't need to declare a priori the, the type of the data. You don't need to create the blueprint or a struct or a class that says how you are going to instantiate, instantiate your data. You have the freedom to instantiate data on the fly. And in principle number four, we will explore how we can validate data, even though it is created with it is represented as the generic data structure. So for the moment, let's put validation concerns aside. And let's see why in terms of complexity, it allows us to reduce system complexity even more. Because in fact, we don't, need, we don't have the class diagram on the right. This diagram is only in our head. It's not part of the program. We have the freedom to manipulate a book even without importing the definition of the book data struct class type or whatever. Um, moreover, when data is represented as data, we can visualize the whole system data, you know, just as a data tree, we can dump it to the console, we can send it over the wire, we can manipulate it with generic tool, uh, visualization tool. Uh, serialization is not a concern at all because in every language there is generic data, uh, there are generic universal libraries that allow you, allows you to take any hash map and convert it back and forth to a JSON string. And when you, we need to do data manipulation for our business logic, we have a plethora of data manipulation functions like sort by, group by, select, 
renamed fields, big fields, omic fields, etc. In fact, there is no need for reflection because we can access any data members or explore the map fields just by using regular functions. So it makes our system less complex and more, and because our data model is more flexible and we don't have to commit to a rigid data model, uh, we, we develop more quickly. Principle number three is about mutation. And in fact, we don't want mutation. And when there is no mutation, lots of bugs simply do not occur. We don't have surprises. We don't have any straight safe concerns because data is read-only in a sense. We don't have side effects. We write pure functions and pure functions are easier to test, easier to maintain, easier to reason about, easier to predict, etc. The only problem is what about performance? Do we clone each time we need to, to somehow manipulate our data or modify it a bit? Do we copy and write? Do we use special data structures? And here is the answer. So we have two options, either to use a special data structure, but in many cases, we don't need a special data structure. We can use the standard native hash maps. And let me tell you how it works. And it is performant because we use a trick called structural sharing. So let's imagine that in our library, we have, that's the data structure, the data shape of our library. We have two fields, catalog and user management. And user management, we have lots of stuff. And in catalog, we have also authors and books. And in books, we have many books. And one of them is Watchmen with three fields. And let's say we want to modify one field in a book. For example, the publication year of Watchmen inside the books by ISBN, inside the catalog. So we want to update the value associated with this path. And instead of 1987, we want to update it to 1986. And when I, when I say update, I mean, I want to create a new version of this hash map where there is a single change, 1986 instead of 1987. So one trivial, and brutal option would be to deep clone the library and modify only the new, ver the new version. But there is a wiser trick that we can do and it's called structural sharing. And for that, we create a new node library. And in this new node, the pieces of data that are not affected by our change, we just copy a reference to them. For example, in our case, the user management is going to be common between the two versions because we modify only the catalog. So we copy a reference to user management and that's cheap. No matter how deep the hash map tree under the user management, copy a reference is a single operation. So it's fast and quick and it doesn't take memory, it doesn't take computation, it's performant. But the catalog, we cannot copy a reference to it because we need a change in the catalog. So we create a new node called catalog in which we copy everything beside the subfield that we need to change, the book by ISBN. And book by ISBN, we create a new node where we copy all the books beside one book, Watchmen. And Watchmen, we create a new node where we copy all the fields from the previous Watchmen book beside the new field that we want to change. So the vast majority of the nodes are shared between the two versions. And because data is immutable, it is safe to share. We don't need to ask ourselves, what about if someone change the field in the use one field under user management? Does it affect the two versions of the data or only one version? This question is irrelevant because data is immutable. And as I said a moment ago, when data is immutable, it's safe to share it. Uh, but there is a little problem with this approach is that sometimes we could have many, many, many references to copy. For example, let's say in books by SBN, we have a million books. We would need to copy a million minus one references. And it's, it's some, it's sometimes it is 
sometimes it is not affordable. So if it's the case, we can use a special data structure called, uh, we could use a special data structure called persistent data structure that was, that were promoted by Clojure in 2009, but nowadays it's available in virtually any programming language by third party library. For example, in JavaScript, we have immutable JS developed by Facebook. In Java, we have Paguro. In Go, we have PEDS. In Clojure, it's part of the language. In C Sharp, we have F Sharp's collection. In Python, we have PyAssistant. In Ruby, we have Hamster. And I'm quite sure that in Scala, it's provided by the language also. In Clojure, that's the only that all the data structures are persistent. In Scala, you can choose if you want mutable data structures or immutable data structures. Okay, so that was principle number four. And principle number four, four says that we do not manipulate data. So up until now, you might ask yourself, okay, that's nice if I want to write a little program, if that's a few lines of code. But for a real program, I cannot afford to live in the wild and to live without data schema. So what about data validation? And let me show you the kind of problem one could have if they don't do data validation. So let's go back to our book info function that receives a book with no type and returns a string based on the book. And in order to create, to return the string, we access the title property of the book and the publication year property of the book. What happens if I pass by mistake an invalid book where instead of title, it is the title? Maybe the user, maybe the user types this mistake, or maybe there is a bug in the front end that sends an invalid request to the back end. Who knows? So what happens if I call book info with an invalid book? No error, but I have something very strange. Instead of an error, I say, mm, was published in 1986. So it silently fails. And this kind of bugs are very, very hard to track and to fix, or mostly very hard to detect, to detect. And the user will not get any notification that the request failed. So that's really, really bad. So what we want to do is to protect our entry points by data validation. One way to do that is to use a schema language called JSON schema. And in JSON schema, we describe the expected shape of our data as data. For example, the, this could be the schema for the book. So the book, the type of the book is an object. Object in JSON means a map. The required fields are title and publication year. Title should be a string and publication year should be an integer that is between 1455 and 2022. Why 1455? Because it's the date of the first ever printed book, the Gutenberg Bible. And that's cool because JSON schema is validated, is used at runtime. So I can expect, uh, I can inspect the uh, the runtime value, which is not possible with static types. I cannot write, express a static type for an integer between a range of numbers. But in JSON schema, it's part of the language. And I need to use a library in order to convert this JSON to something to a schema and to validate, to use the schema to validate my data. In JavaScript, there is a library called AJV for JSON schema validation. And here I will do something very, very simple. In my code book info, before I execute the body of the function, I will validate that the, what I receive as an argument, the function receives as an argument, has the expected shape, is valid according to my schema. And if it's not the case, I will throw an error and with an explanation, a description about what part of the validation failed. 
So I will not fail silently. Instead, let me show you what happens if I'm parsing a valid JSON, but a JSON that does not describe a valid book. And I call book info with this invalid book. Now I will have an exception that says book info call with invalid args and with an explanation returned by the library automatically. Data should have required property title. And this could return back to the user as uh, with a, probably a 400 bad request error. And anyway, this is, we need to do so no matter if we use types or not types, we cannot use types in order to make sure that uh, data over the wire is valid, or even if we do so, we will not detect it at compile time. Of course, it will, the error will happen anyway, only at runtime. So in a sense, JSON schema is more powerful than types because we can express dynamic properties of our data and also more flexible because uh, we can decide where, where and when we want to validate. The flip side of it, the downside is that it's not mandatory. So sometimes we can forget to validate that and we will have very bad behavior of the system. As I mentioned, JSON schema libraries are available in probably virtually any language. In JavaScript, we have AGV. In Java, we have snowy JSON. In C Sharp, we have JSON schema. In Python, we have JSCON. In Ruby, we have JSCON schema. And I'm sure that in Scala, there is something also. And probably in any programming language. So before we wrap up this presentation, let me tell you where, uh, where does data oriented programming come from? I didn't, I did not invent it. In fact, it has its root in the origin of programming. And when John McCarthy invented Lisp in 1958, in fact, Lisp stands for um, list processing. And John McCarthy suggested to represent data using immutable lists. And he, he, he planted the root of the first data validation uh, functions. And it was done in a generic and immutable way. Then in 1981, Bruce McLennan published a very, very nice paper values and called values and objects in programming languages, where he clarifies the distinction between values and objects. Objects, not in the sense of object on the programming, but in the sense of something that has a state and values, something that isn't, isn't value is something that does not have a state. Uh, then in 2000, Phil Bagwell invented a data structure called ideal hash trees for, um, it was not related to data related programming, but in 2007, Rich Hickey, the inventor of closure used the ideal hash tree data structure in order to provide a, perf a performant an efficient implementation of persistent data structures. But just a year before that, Ben Mosley and Peter Marx published a paper called Out of the Tarpit, where they clarified the distinction between, so first of all, this, the definition of complexity that I mentioned at the beginning of the present, my presentation as what makes a system hard to understand comes from them. And they suggest a distinction between accidental complexity and essential complexity. Essential complexity is has to do with the problem that you try to solve. And if the problem you try to solve is hard, it will be hard to solve it no matter what programming language you use. But according to the authors, many times, because we use the wrong technology, the wrong program or the programming language or the wrong paradigm, we add on top of this essential complexity, a bunch of accidental complexity. And in fact, data oriented programming is a way to reduce the accidental complexity of our system. And the core of it is the persistent data structures and the immutability of data. And since 2009, the persistent data structures implementation from Clojure has been ported to all programming languages. So today in 2022, there is no excuse to mutate 
data and it should be avoided by all means. Let's summarize. Data-oriented programming is about treating data as a first-class citizen. And for that, we need to comply with four principles. First of all, we separate between code and data. We can write our code either in FP style or OP style, doesn't matter. Then we separate between data representation and data schema. That's principle number four. It's not in order. And for representing data, we prefer to choose generic data structures. And by no means we allow ourselves to mutate data. We leverage persistent data structures to manipulate data in an immutable way. Uh, can we take questions on YouTube? Let me check. If yes. There were questions. Okay, just a moment. I'm trying to find my YouTube window. It was there, but... Hello. Hey, I hey. see there are questions. There is not the question, but or or a question or a what do you call oh it? that is a great book thank you <laughs> performance issues is the biggest pain point while trying to inform my colleagues uh, right but if you use so first of all if you don't have huge data structures you can use the structural sharing trick i mentioned and it is it takes seven lines of code to implement it I can share the implementation. Can I share uh, stuff on, on YouTube? Sure. On Zoom? Uh, Just... Let's see. OK. I wrote an article about that. Seven lines of code to implement uh, structural sharing. Let me find it. Uh... OK, structural sharing with seven lines of code. All right, so that's naive structural sharing is a good fit for non small to medium hash maps up to thousand entries at each level. And if you have if you have if you have more than that, then you need to use the persistent data structures library taken from Clojure and that have been ported to all programming languages. There is another uh, little challenge is that if you are uh, used to write your code in such a way that it mutates in place, it would require the bit of effort to get used to not mutating in place. But there is no perf real performance issue unless you you know you do something i don't know you write an operating system or you need to launch rockets on uh, on the moon or to do trading or uh, uh, not data mining uh, bitcoin mining or stuff like that but if you do regular uh, web development back end front end you should not be alone. You should not have any problem with persistent data structures. Okay, exciting getting these to other languages. Was one of the most exciting things about learning Haskell. Yeah, I don't think it's part of Haskell, by the way. Haskell is popular for being immutable, but Haskell does not really provide the, the structural sharing trick I mentioned. They do something slightly different. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, you very much for your prepare, you, can, yeah, you can take a look at the book. Um, that's it. Basically. Thank you very much for your presentation. When did the book come out? It came up. Uh, I think in the print version in uh, July. Oh, this year? Yeah, but it was available for a long time as a MIP and ebook. Oh, okay. 
Now it's even available in audio. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I, I wrote an application in the end of night this uh, CMS for a web <laughs> for web and I should have read this book or ha heard your talk before I did that because they <laughs> more, <laughs> more or less ran into everything <laughs> what you discussed here. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Alright. <laughs> yes. Yes. Again, thank you very much and also thank you for yeah. all uh, answering all the questions again thank you very much we'll put out links um uh, after we published like your sure uh, your presentation we'll put out all the links and all to your books and everything again thank you very much jonathan my pleasure yes thank you.